The mediocre Ghostbusters film of 2016 was an attempt to basically remake a Ghostbusters movie similar in style and format to the first two films, but with an all-female cast. What's interesting is that after that creative and commercial failure that disappointed fans, a decision was made to actually produce a very different type of Ghostbusters film, something that was quite unconventional and visually and tonally different from the first two films. Afterlife is what I would describe as a kind of love letter to those movies. Set over 30 years after the events of the original films, it tells the story of Egon Spengler's family after his death. His estranged daughter and her two children inherit his home in a remote rural town in Oklahoma. An elderly Egon died a week earlier of a heart attack while attempting to lure a ghost into a trap on his farm. Harold Ramis, who played Egon, passed away in 2014, so they used CGI to digitally map a recreation of his face onto Bob Gunton and Ivan Reitman, and it works reasonably well. The character doesn't speak in the film. They didn't get, like, a sound-alike actor or anything. And also, Ramis appears in archive footage from the first two films. Egon's daughter, Callie, resents that her father became a recluse and put his work before his relationship with her. It's fairly obvious to the audience that a justifiable reason will be given for this later in the film and that Egon will ultimately be posthumously redeemed. Her son Trevor quickly gets a job working in a fast food restaurant and he has a crush on a co-worker. Callie's daughter is Phoebe, a bit of a know-it-all science geek character. I have to say, the characters of Callie and Phoebe are not really all that likeable. They're just a bit one-sided, neurotic, argumentative and generally a bit unpleasant at times. So much of their story centres around adapting to a new life and living in this dilapidated old house. They discover that the house is haunted and some force is helping Phoebe uncover a mystery at the farm. They also find an old Ghostbusters trap and with the help of her new friend, Podcast, and science teacher Gary Gruberson, played by Paul Rudd, they open it, releasing an entity. Paul Rudd probably should have been the main protagonist, given that Gruberson is actually a decent character. Rudd plays, ultimately, the same kind of character that he usually plays in most of his movies. The easygoing, sometimes awkward, but kind of funny and charming everyman. I can't really tell the difference between Gruberson and Scott Lang, to be honest. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, necessarily. He's hired to play a specific kind of role that he plays very well. Just like how Bruce Willis or Clint Eastwood or Tommy Lee Jones always played much the same type of character in the films they appeared in. Along the way, they find more old Ghostbusters equipment, including the Cadillac, of course, the Ecto-1, which they get up and running, they discover that the nearby mine contains a Gazarian temple and that the forces within it have been contained by Egon's proton cannons. So that's what he was working on the whole time and it explains why he has been absent from his family and even his fellow Ghostbusters. Phoebe had no idea that her grandfather had been a Ghostbuster because that's something that Callie had kept from her. And ultimately herself, Callie and Trevor have to uncover what Egon was working on and help to finish what he started. The fate of the world hangs in the balance once again, and who are you going to call at a time like that? Well, the old Ghostbusters crew, of course. Ray Stance, played by Dan Aykroyd, Peter Venkman, played by Bill Murray, and Winston Zedmore, played by Ernie Hudson. All return, albeit briefly, in a fairly heartwarming conclusion, and I think it will make die-hard Ghostbusters fans smile. It was nice seeing all four Ghostbusters fighting side by side once again, even if Harold Ramis is only there in CG form. But it's a respectful tribute. In the end, Callie, Phoebe and Trevor get to reconcile with Egon and then the film ends. Although there is a mid credit scene between Bill Murray and Sigourney Weaver, that's quite funny, and then quite a substantial end credit scene between Ernie Hudson and Annie Potts. Oh yeah, Annie Potts is back as Janine Melnitz. They talk about Egon and Winston discusses his business success over the years and his fondness for his days as a Ghostbuster. It concludes with him entering the abandoned Ghostbusters HQ and the Cadillac Ecto-1 is driven into the parking garage. The film is left open for further adventures which I presume will see the torch passed to the next generation of Ghostbusters. Like I say, the film is visually and tonally quite different to the first two films which is absolutely fine. The filmmakers are to be commended for trying to make Afterlife its very own thing. They didn't attempt to emulate or redo the originals, and I think that's a good thing. So even though I don't think Afterlife 
is a particularly strong film, it at least has its own recognisable identity. And it's not a bad identity. What I will say is that the humour is a bit patchy and inconsistent in places. Some gags work, a lot of them don't. I think the cast is more than good enough to carry some good comedy. I just don't think the dialogue was there. And as they say, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. It needed to be a bit funnier, in my opinion, without descending into some kind of farce, outright comedy. Also, the pacing of the film isn't great. It takes quite a while for anything substantial to start happening. And I found that the film was dragging up until the halfway point, which is where the first major action scene takes place, which is the one you probably saw in the trailer, where they're driving the Ecto-1 through the town and chasing down the ghost. After that, the film does take off. There's just enough fan service paid in this film, with the original cast included, and each one getting something useful to say and do. But some fans will be disappointed because their roles are just glorified cameos. Afterlife primarily centres around a new cast of characters, who, I believe, are just genuinely not that interesting, and, as I've already mentioned, a few of them aren't all that likeable. Given how slow the film is in its first half, I would actually understand why the impatient audience members out there might actually switch off after the halfway point, to be honest. I think the ending is decent enough to warrant hanging on until the end, but the first couple of acts of the film are not particularly compelling and the characters' story arcs are uninteresting. Afterlife just isn't a great film. It's okay. I think it's watchable, and I commend it for trying to do something different and not retread old ground, while still paying homage to the legacy of the first two films. But because of that, it is a bit too reliant on the nostalgia factor. And if you took that away from this film, and if the original cast members weren't in it, the film would lose its primary selling point. Ultimately, Afterlife is not a bad effort. It's just one of those films that you don't necessarily regret watching, you just wouldn't be all that interested in watching again. It leaves little impact. And that's not a great thing to say about a film, is it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Did you enjoy Ghostbusters Afterlife? Thanks very much for watching. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.